Well, let's turn to the Gospel according to John, chapter 1. This Gospel of John was written quite a long time after the other Gospels. The other Gospels were already in use, in extent, and thus John does not follow the pattern of the other Gospels as he records for us the life of Christ. Uh, but John pretty much sums up his Gospel uh, doing or taking the last part of the ministry of Christ, spends a lot of time in the last year of Christ in his gospel. It was thought to be written from Ephesus. At 70 AD, when the Roman troops came in and conquered Jerusalem, destroying the city, killing a million, over a million Jews, many of the Jews escaped before Jerusalem fell, and most of the church did escape and did not suffer the destruction uh, by Titus and the Roman troops. They were directed by a word of prophecy to leave the city on that night, and for some unknown reason, as they left out of the east gate according to the direction of the prophecy, somehow Titus did not have the troops positioned at the east gate that night, and thus the church escaped. John went to Ephesus, and according to the traditions, he took with him Mary, the mother of Jesus. And there at Ephesus, uh, John uh, continued the ministry, and uh, there are early church records that speak of John's ministry there. We know that John was then, uh, they attempted to uh, kill him. They boiled him in oil, uh, but it didn't have any fatal effect upon him. And so he was exiled to the island of Patmos. And the thing is, you see, God wasn't through with him yet. God wanted to give to him the book of Revelation. And so the book of Revelation was written from uh, the Isle of Patmos, but uh, the Gospel of John is the last of the Gospels written. It is a uh, later work, and so uh, John, in his Gospel, is thinking probably of the Greek mind because he has moved into a culture uh, that is a Grecian culture in Ephesus. And so he's probably uh, thinking of a Gospel that would appeal to the Greeks. Its uh, appeal is to the unbeliever. And so at the end of the gospel, he said, Jesus did a lot of other things that are not recorded. But these have been recorded that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah and by believing have life in his name. He closes his gospel saying, if all of the things that were done by Jesus were written down, uh, there probably would not be enough books in the libraries to uh, give a full account of all that Jesus had done. So the Gospel of John is a great book to encourage a person who is an unbeliever to read. Because again, God said his word would not return void. It would accomplish the purposes for which he had sent it. And if John was written that people might believe that Jesus was the Messiah and by believing have life in his name, then as a person reads the book of John, that will be accomplished in their heart as they will understand that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. So with the unbeliever in mind, and especially the Greek mindset, 
he declares, in the beginning was the word, the logos. Now, in the Greek, uh, in their philosophy, they say that behind a word is a thought. In other words, words express our thoughts. And behind the thought is a thinker. You can't have a thought without a thinker. So in the beginning was the word. Uh, and with that comes the, he, he tells you now that behind the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. John's plain declaration, the word was God. Most cults fail on this point of acknowledging that the word was God. But you can't make it any plainer or clearer than what John has declared. The Jehovah Witnesses, for instance, say that the word or that Jesus was the Michael, the archangel. Uh, the Mormons say that he was the brother of Lucifer, uh, that he is a created being. It's interesting that as Matthew begins his gospel, he begins it with Abraham. He gives you the genealogy of Jesus, and he traces him back to Abraham, and then he tells of the birth of Jesus, his baptism, and then his ministry. Mark doesn't tell us about the birth of Jesus, but he does tell us about his baptism and his ministry. Luke goes back to uh, the account of the announcement to Zechariah the prophet of the birth of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. He goes back to the announcement to Mary of the birth of Jesus, and then he tells us and gives us the account of the birth and things that transpired around the birth and some of the early life of Jesus. He, in his genealogy, takes you back to Adam. But John goes back one step further. In the beginning, now, when was that? Was there a beginning? You know, in the beginning was the word. He, when the beginning was, he was already there. In the beginning was the word, past tense. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And then he tells us that all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. The book of Genesis begins, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible doesn't try to tell us anything about how long ago the beginning was. But in the beginning, God created. He was there before the beginning. God is timeless. He is outside of the time continuum. And so here John sort of takes up much as does Genesis, going back to the very beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made by him. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word was God, and all things were made by him. It is interesting, there are many passages in the New Testament 
uh, that do uh, ascribe the creation to Jesus. Uh, there in uh, Colossians, uh, verse 16 of chapter 1, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, speaking of the angelic beings, all things were created by him and for him. Not only is Jesus the creator, but he is the object of creation. They were created for him. So know this. That's why you exist. He created you for himself. In the book of Revelation, chapter uh, 5, as they're uh, praising, or chapter 4, the response of the uh, elders to the worship of the cherubim, they say, Thou art worthy, O God, to receive glory and honor, for you have created all things, and for your good pleasure they are created. I think it's extremely important that we recognize and realize that I was created for him. But then Paul takes us one step further, and he said, he is before all things, pre-existing all things, and by him, he said, all things consist. Uh, that word consist is held together. God created things visible and invisible. <laughs> God created the visible things out of invisible things. Uh, we're made up of atoms and molecules which cannot really be seen but here we are created out of invisible things and uh, this great mystery of of creation and one of the mysteries is that things are made up of atoms but atoms are sort of a mystery in that they are made up of the nucleus of the atom which is little protons and around the protons there revolve these electrons now Coulomb's law of electricity talks about the expelling force of uh, like particles in other words positive charges have a repelling force against positive charges Opposites attract. I guess that goes with people too. I, I hear marriage, opposites attract, but uh, the likes repel, so be careful about you know, who you get involved with. But uh, <laughs> there is so much expelling force of positive charges that if you had one gram of just positive charges on the North Pole and one gram on the South Pole, the pressure against them, it would take 1,800 pounds to hold that gram of protons on the uh, North Pole and on the South Pole. There would be that much repelling force at that distance. The, the, we do know that the atom bomb was created by releasing uh, the positive charges that are in the heart of an atom. And, and we know the tremendous power uh, that is generated when we can upset the nucleus of the atom and allow the protons to act according to the natural uh, bent of being pushed apart. Somehow they're glued together. The scientists made up, a, they called it the atomic glue, the Masons, but uh, that theory sort of went by the board. The mystery is what holds the universe together. The power that holds matter together. And, and that's what is revealed here. By him, all things are held together, or all things consist. In the book of Hebrews, 
God, who at different times and in different manners spoke in the times past to our fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So John is telling us here, right off, that he is the creator. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life. And the life was the light of men. The hope for us is in Jesus Christ. In him, life, eternal life. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And so Jesus, shining in the darkness, but the darkness is not able to comprehend or apprehend this light. There was a man who was sent from God whose name was John. So uh, he's now going to tell us a little bit about the mystery uh, or the ministry of, of John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. And he was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. And that is the true light, that is Jesus, which lights every man that comes into the world. For he was in the world, referring again to Jesus. The world was made by him, a second assertion that he was the creator. And the world knew him not. Now we are celebrating the uh, advent of our Savior into the world. Uh, we are not certain of the dates, and that isn't important. Uh, we are celebrating the fact that Jesus came to this earth, and uh, any date is all right as far as the celebration of that very fact. Uh, people get caught up because uh, it's pretty provable that Jesus wasn't born December 25th, that our celebration, what we call Christmas, is uh, sort of an adaptation of a pagan holiday. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't make that much difference. It, it, well, it does, I guess, the way some people celebrate it. They are pagans, and they celebrate it in a pagan way. And if you are looking forward to the office parties and getting drunk and so forth, then pagan... Uh, have your holiday, but don't call it Christmas. Call it Saturnalia uh, like the Romans did. But uh, to us, it is a day that we set aside to celebrate the coming of Jesus into the world. He was in the world. The world was made by him. But sadly, the world knew him not. He came to his own. That would be the Jewish race. But the, he came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many did receive him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to those who believed upon his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Our new birth, as many as received him, became the sons of God. How did I become a son of God? By a new birth. The birth was not by the will of man, but by the will of God. So, uh, not the will of the flesh. I'm born of the Spirit by the will of God. The Word was made flesh. He dwelt among us. We beheld his glory the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So basically, as you read this, you can start off with verses uh, 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, and the Word was made flesh. 
That is, God became man. He dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Coming back to John, he bore witness of him, and he cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that came after me is preferred before me, for he was before me, pre-existence of Jesus. And his fullness have all we received, and grace of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. John came to bear witness of the coming of the Messiah. He was to go before him, to prepare the hearts of the people to receive him. And John was not out to promote himself or to promote his own ministry. Concerning Jesus, he said, he must increase and I must decrease. And every one of us should actually have that same attitude as John. He must increase, I must decrease. So of his fullness have we all received grace for grace. For the law, it was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So man, through the law, related to God. It was the means by which sinful man could relate to a holy God. It was through the sacrifices of uh, the law that the sins were covered and the door was open for man to fellowship with God through the peace offerings of the Old Testament. Uh, but there's a new covenant that God has made, and it is the covenant of grace. And it is by the grace of God, but it was made possible through Jesus Christ and through his sacrifice and it's interesting, all of the sacrifices of the Old Testament were just pointing ahead to the sacrifice of Jesus. And so, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man had seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has manifested him. No man has seen God at any time because, as Jesus said to the woman of Samaria, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And no man can see his spirit. And so no man has seen God at any time. There were manifestations. Uh, there were men who thought that they saw God. And uh, in uh, Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord. And uh, he, he said that he had seen God, but in reality, it was the manifestation. And Jesus is the manifestation of God. So no man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has manifested him. This is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, just who are you? And he confessed and he denied not, but he confessed, I am not the Messiah. They were wondering John concerning John. He was an interesting character. And he was baptizing down at Beth, Beth Abra which is right towards the upper end of the Dead Sea, not too far from Jericho. And that's where John was baptizing. And um, they, they came out and they said, just who are you? Because if you baptize someone, you should have some authority for baptizing them. And that's basically what they were looking for, who gave you the authority to baptize? Just who are you? And he, he confessed to them, I'm not the Messiah. 
So they said, well, who are you then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Now this creates a little bit of a um, problem in that Jesus in Matthew's gospel, uh, in speaking of John the Baptist, said, if you can receive it, this is Elijah of whom uh, the prophet spake. Mike Malachi said that uh, the Lord would send Elijah before the face of the Lord uh, to uh, turn the hearts of the children to their fathers and so forth. So John is denying that he is Elijah. How can that be when Jesus said, well, if you can accept this or receive it, John was Elijah. When Jesus was with his disciples and talking about John, the disciples are talking about his, his, he, himself as the Messiah. They said, how is it that the scriptures say that Elijah must first come? And he said, he has come and they've done with him what they would. So how do you reconcile this, where John is saying, no, I'm not Elijah? Well, if you go back to Luke's gospel, when the angel was announcing to his father, Zechariah, that his wife, Elizabeth, was going to have a son who would go before the Lord, he said he will go in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. In other words, he won't be the complete fulfillment of the prophecy of Malachi. That Jesus is coming again. And that before Jesus comes again, Elijah will return and be a prophet again to the nation of Israel. And he will turn their hearts unto the Father. And, and so in Revelation chapter 11, you have uh, the two witnesses that come to the earth and who minister there in Jerusalem uh, to the Jews, and that will be the fulfillment of the prophecy of Malachi. So in a sense, uh, he's not, when he's saying, I'm not Elijah, I'm not the fulfillment of the prophecy of Malachi. That's later. But uh, he is, of course, uh, in the, so they finally said, well, then who are you? That we might give an answer to those that sent us to find out. What do you say of yourself? And so he said, you know, I'm not the, the prophet that Malachi uh, was talking about, but I'm the voice of one. He's going back to Isaiah that is crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. So he, his claim of himself, I am the one that, he, that Isaiah was talking about. Now, it is interesting, in those days, when a king was going to visit an area, they would send out people to repair the roads, to level off the high spots, to fill in the ruts and the potholes, so that as the king would come, it would be a smooth ride rather than a rough ride. They would take the curves out as much as possible. So uh, that was the duty of those that would go to prepare for the king to come to an area. And so Elijah, uh, I'm the prophet that Elijah was talking about who went out to make, to tell the people, make the roads straight, to prepare for the coming of the king, Jesus Christ. So, uh, they asked him and said unto him, then why do you baptize if you're not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the other prophet? Now that other prophet was the one that Moses predicted. 
as he was talking about the Messiah. There will come a prophet like unto myself, and to him shall you give heed. So are you the prophet that Moses was saying was going to come? And John answered them saying, I am baptizing with water. But there is standing one among you whom you do not know. He it is who comes after me. He is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I'm not worthy to unloose. I'm not unworthy to loose his sandal. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Now the next day, after this questioning of John, he saw Jesus coming unto him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It would be interesting and probably in heaven we will find out the answer. But it would be interesting to know how many lambs under the law have been slain as sacrifices for sin. No doubt into the millions. It'll be an interesting uh, trivia thing in heaven to discover just how many lambs sacrificed. None of them could take away sin. None of them could provide a removing of sin. They did provide a covering for sin. It took the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, to take away our sins. So John is here declaring, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, he was coming after me. He was preferred before me, for he was before me. Again, the acknowledgement of the preexistence of Jesus. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you will see the Spirit descending and remaining, the same is he that baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, just before Jesus ascended into heaven. He told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. For he said, John indeed did baptize with water unto repentance, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. And so he was instructing them just before he ascended, Wait here in Jerusalem. In a few days, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now here, John is saying that he was baptizing with water, but uh, the one who sent him to baptize told him upon whom he saw the Spirit descending and abiding, he was going to baptize them with the Holy Spirit. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. John's message was repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And water was the element in which John was baptizing the people. John was the baptizer, water was the element, and the issue was repentance. John said, there's one who's coming after me. He's mightier than I am. I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. And he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so Jesus is the baptizer. 
The element in which you are baptized by Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And the issue is power. You will receive power, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be witnesses of me, both in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Many people have been baptized in John's baptism, the baptism of repentance, acknowledging their repenting of sin and wanting to live a new life, not after the flesh. That life was buried in the waters of baptism. As many as you were baptized were buried with Christ. But many people have not yet experienced that baptism by Jesus, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And their lives are not empowered to do the work of Christ and the power of witnessing uh, because they need that baptism by Jesus Christ. So John said, I saw and I bore record that this is the Son of God. And so, uh, again, those that are, you know, here is John right here in the first chapter. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And now John gives the witness. I bear witness, this is the Son of God. So again, the next day after, John was standing with two of his disciples. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and he saw them following, and he said unto them, What are you seeking? And they said, Rabbi, which is to say, and being interpreted, Master, where do you live? And he said, Come and see. And so they came and they saw where he was living, and they abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour, or it was getting late in the afternoon, about four o'clock. Now one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother. And he first found his own brother, Simon, and he said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is, by interpretation, the Christ. Now, I think that it is important that when we read of Jesus and we read of Jesus Christ, or we read the Lord Jesus Christ, we realize that that's not first, middle, and last name. Lord is his title. That is what he is to us. He's my Lord, my master. That, that signifies relationship, my relationship to him as Lord. Jesus is his name. It, it is the Greek for Joshua, which means Jehovah is salvation. But that's his name. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. The the angel told Mary to call his name Jesus, later Joseph, when he was uh, trying to figure things out. The angel assured that that which was conceived in Mary was from the Holy Spirit. She was to bring forth a son. He was to call his name Jesus, Jehovah Shua. Christ is the Greek word for anointed, and it is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Mashiach, or the Messiah. So when you read of Christ, you're reading of the Messiah. You're understanding that he is the promised Messiah, the promised Messiah of the Old Testament, as God was promising to ascend the anointed one, the Messiah, and that is Christos, Christ, the, the, the anointed one. So, uh, here he gives you the, he is, uh, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So, he's telling you that 
that is Greek word Christos is the Hebrew Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. When Jesus beheld him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah, but you will be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. So it's interesting how that John again is interpreting because uh, his readers are more or less uh, the, the Greek people. They understood the Greek language, and so John is careful to interpret uh, these words into uh, the Greek for them. Now, the following day, Jesus went forth into Galilee, and he found Philip. And he said to Philip, follow me. Jesus is now gathering together disciples. Disciples that would later be ordained as apostles. And so Philip, and here's how the thing is just growing. Uh, Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Today, they have discovered the site of ancient Bethsaida. They didn't know where it was for such a long time, but now the archaeologists are there uncovering the remains of the city of Bethsaida. Uh, it was so totally destroyed that uh, even the location was lost for a long time. You remember Jesus said, Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! And it's interesting that those cities that he announced a war upon uh, do not exist today. But uh, the reason why Bethsaida was not found is that it is now probably a mile and a half or two miles from the Sea of Galilee. It was once a, uh, a, on the shores of Galilee, but over the many years, uh, the muddy Jordan River has built up silt in the upper end of the Sea of Galilee, and the silt sort of created a silt dam and added to the land mass uh, uh, there on the upper end of the Sea of Galilee so that Bethsaida is now uh, about a mile and a half, two miles away from the Sea of Galilee. And that's why they didn't find it because they kept looking around the shores of the Sea of Galilee for Bethsaida. But that was the home of Peter and Andrew and of uh, Philip. Philip found Nathaniel, so here's the way it's spreading. They, they, they discover Jesus, and then they tell others about their discovery, and that's the way the gospel is spread even today. We discover our Lord, and then we share with others the wonderful discovery. So Philip found Nathaniel, and he said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, he's the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was one of those cities that, uh, you know, was sort of looked down as a rough, rugged city. And can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, Well, come and see. And so Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him. And he said of him, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. And Nathanael said unto him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said, Well, before Philip called you, when you were under that fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered, unto him, and he said, Because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You're going to see greater things than these. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I send to you, Hereafter you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Back in Genesis, when Jacob was fleeing 
from his brother Esau. And he had come to Bethel. And there, weary, tired, he lay down on the ground using a rock for a pillow. And he had this dream. And he saw this ladder that was reaching up into heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on this ladder. Jesus is here declaring, I am the ladder by which man has access to heaven. I'm the ladder that Jacob saw in his vision. No man, he will say in the 14th chapter, can come to the Father but by me. Here declaring, he is the ladder by which you have access to God. How true that is. Now the third day, it's interesting, John takes us in subsequent days here. There was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Now Cana is over the hill from Nazareth. And uh, the mother of Jesus was there. Some believe that it was a relative, perhaps, of Mary that was getting married. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So they're walking over the hill down into the valley to this little uh, village of Cana. And when they wanted wine, they'd run out of wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. Now, Jesus up to this point had not performed any miracles. This is the first miracle that Jesus had performed. Uh, there are some oh, writings uh, that talk about Jesus in uh, his early years healing birds and uh, in Egypt there's the story that he made these little clay pigeons and then gave life to them and they flew away uh, but that's all just you know uh, imaginations uh, this is the first miracle of Jesus but it would seem that Mary is hum somehow suggesting to Jesus that he solved the problem for them, saying, they don't have any more wine. And he said unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. <coughs> Evidently, Mary did understand just who her son was. The angel had told her that he would be the son of the highest, be known as the son of the highest, and, and knew that he had these powers, though they had not yet really been manifested. And his mother saith to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. She knew her son that if there was a problem, he was wanting to take care of it. Here's an embarrassing problem. They have the uh, wedding feast and perhaps the groom was poor. He couldn't afford to uh, have enough wine for the guest. And so uh, Mary presents the problems to Jesus and he sort of rebukes her in a way but yet she knows that his heart will be touched by the need. And so there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews. These were water pots to uh, hold the water for the purification ceremonies. And they contained two or three firkins apiece. Uh, now a Firkin is about nine gallons. So Jesus said unto them, fill the water pots with water. 
And so they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Now draw out and bear it to the governor of the feast. And so they took it to him. And the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine. He didn't know from whence it was. But the servants that drew the water, they knew. And the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. He said unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth the good wine. And then uh, that which is worse uh, when they are pretty well drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the beginning of miracles that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee as he manifested his glory and his disciples believed on him. So things are beginning to gel now with Jesus and his disciples. After this, he went down to Capernaum and his mother and his brothers and the disciples, and they continued there not many days. Capernaum became the headquarters of Jesus' ministry. Beautiful, beautifully situated there on the Sea of Galilee. It's a, it's a spot that I always enjoy visiting. Uh, the ruins that are there at Capernaum are fascinating ruins. Uh, they've sort of um, spoiled them in a way. They've put up a building uh, supposedly over the house of Peter. Looks like a flying saucer. It doesn't fit with all of the old artifacts that go back uh, to the first century. But um, it, it's a, the, the lake there. It, it's just beautiful. And that's where Jesus more or less made his headquarters there at Capernaum in his earthly ministry. And so many of the miracles and so forth of Jesus were done there at Capernaum. And so uh, the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Uh, this is at the beginning of his public ministry, and it would appear that he attended three Passovers, this being the first, the third, he was crucified on the third Passover. But Jesus went to Jerusalem. Notice he went up to Jerusalem. Uh, now, uh, in, a, in a map, south is usually considered down, and north is considered up. Uh, but uh, you never do say you're going down to Jerusalem. That's just something they won't say. You always go up to Jerusalem. Now, you might be coming from Mount Everest, but you'd say, well, let's go up to Jerusalem, uh, the city of God. You never go down, but you always go up to Jerusalem. And so Jesus uh, was going up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money. These men were profiteering off of people's desire to know and to worship God. I think that's the worst kind of profiteering. Taking advantage of people who want to serve and worship God. The changers of money. The common coinage was Roman coinage. It had the image of Caesar on it. And thus, they would not allow you to put into the offering coffers any Roman coins. If you wanted to give to God, you couldn't give a Roman coin because of the image of Caesar on it. And so they had a lucrative little business. People who want to give to God, well, I'll tell you what, we've got some shekels here. And so money changers, we will change your Roman coins for the temple shekel so that you can give to God. But what they were doing was charging exorbitant rates of exchange so that you might uh, have, say, a dollar in Roman coins and they would give you maybe 60 cents worth of 
shekels so that it was ripping off the people who were wanting to give to God. In giving or making a sacrifice, the sacrifice had to be perfect. It could not have any spot or blemish. So to bring a sacrifice from your own flocks, the priest would examine it to see if it was without a blemish or spot. And they would examine it carefully until they could find a blemish and then they would rebuke you for trying to offer a blemished animal for a sacrifice. And they would direct you over to the stalls where they were selling certified kosher sheep. They had already been examined by the priest and uh, they have been accepted for sacrifices, but they would charge an exorbitant price for them. In the city, you could buy a sparrow, three or four of them, for a penny, but they would always find some flaw in it. And so they would force you to buy the doves or whatever that uh, they had certified as ready for sacrifice, but again, paying a good price. So that on his first visit recorded to Jerusalem for the Passover, well, I guess there was one when he was 12, but uh, on, on this one, as he is an adult in his ministry, uh, he makes this scourge of a small cords, and he drove them all out of the temple now, I don't know how you picture Jesus when you think of him as sort of a effeminate-looking, you know, oh, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Look upon this little child. And remember, he was a carpenter. He was a rugged, outdoor man. I mean, he looked at this. He became so incensed over it. He makes this little scourge, this little whip, and he begins to drive them out. He overturns the tables. He sets the animals free. He's creating a real hubbub right there in the temple precincts. And he said unto them that sold the doves, take these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a house of merchandise. And the angels remember, I mean, the disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. Psalm 69, it's interesting. Psalm 69 is one of the most quoted psalms in the New Testament. And uh, you'll, you'll find a lot of quotations here in John of Psalm, from Psalm 69. The psalm that declared, the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. The, it, it's, it's angered me, it's upset me to see what's going on. Then answered the Jews and said to him, what sign do you show us seeing that you do these things? It's the same thing with John the Baptist. Uh, who are you? Who gave you the authority to do this? And so they're, they're now challenging Jesus. Just who gave you the authority to come in and to do this? And Jesus answered and said unto them, you want a sign? Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, 46 years was this temple in building, and you will rear it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. He was talking about his death and his resurrection. You want a sign? It'll be the resurrection. That's the great sign that Jesus is the Son of God. Another time when they were asking for a sign, he said, a wicked and an adulterous generation is looking for signs, but no sign will be given to it. But the sign of the prophet Jonah, 
For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so the signs were not in the miracles that Jesus wrought. The sign, the ultimate sign, would be his resurrection. And so if you will read in conjunction with this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you will read the importance of the resurrection. For if there is no resurrection, there is no sign. If there is no sign, then our faith is in vain, our hope is in vain. Our loved ones who have died, they've perished, and we are of all men most miserable. But now has Jesus risen from the dead? He fulfilled that sign. It's interesting, when they had brought him for trial to try to get the sentence of death, one of the witnesses that came against him said, this man said that if you destroyed the temple, he would rebuild it in three days. Uh, and, of course, that was one of the charges that was leveled against Jesus. But as John tells us, he wasn't talking about the temple that Herod had built. They, at the time that Jesus was there, they'd already been building on that thing for 46 years. Can you imagine a, a, a building today that it, they would still be working? They would say, when did you start this? Well, oh, 46 years ago. The thing was, it will be 18 more years before they complete it. And, and so uh, they are looking at Jesus and uh, thinking that he's talking about the temple that was built by Herod, but he's talking about his own body, uh, the temple of his own body, that you destroy it, and in three days I'll rise again. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. All of a sudden, after the resurrection, oh, yes. Remember, he said, in three days he would rebuild it. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Now, uh, he is beginning to do many miracles, public miracles, uh, by which he is proving to the people that he is indeed the Messiah, opening the eyes of the blind and just setting at liberty those that were bound and all and beginning to show them that he was the Messiah through the miracles and many believed because they saw the miracles. But there's something interesting here. Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. They believed in Jesus, but they weren't really committed to Jesus. You know, there's just an awful lot of people like that today. They believe in Jesus but they're not really committed to Jesus. What is their position? I really don't know. Uh, I am concerned. I'm concerned that if we would poll our Sunday morning congregation, that the vast majority would say, oh yes, I believe in Jesus. But they're not committed to Jesus. Jesus isn't the Lord of their lives. And thus Jesus wouldn't commit himself to them, knowing that they probably didn't have what we would call a saving faith, just to believe. But uh, as James said, 
You say that you believe God. Do you think that that's something special? That that's supposed to do something for you? You believe in God? He said the devils believe in God. And they fear and tremble before him. So it's more than just a head knowledge. Jesus wouldn't commit himself to them because he knew them. He knew men. And he didn't need that anyone should testify of man to him, for he knew what was in man. He knew those who had a genuine faith, not just because they saw miracles and they said, whoa, that's exciting, but that they had committed themselves to serve and to follow him. Am I just a believer? Or am I truly committed? He knows me. He knows my heart. Has he committed himself to me? That's the important thing, knowing what's in my heart. Father, we thank you for uh, this beginning of the Gospel of John and the introduction to Jesus that John does give to us. And Lord, we pray that you will just help us to examine ourselves, knowing that if we would judge ourselves, we won't be judged by you. And Lord, we do believe. But we realize, Lord, that there is something more than just believing that you did exist, believing that you were a good man, believing that you were a great teacher, even believing that you are the Son of God. But there is that commitment, commitment of ourselves to you. And Lord, help us that we might make that commitment, that you might indeed be committed to us. These things, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here at the front to pray for you tonight who desire prayer for any cause or reason. So we would encourage you, if you have a need in your life, don't just leave, but come on down and let them minister to you. And God wants to help you tonight. God wants to work out those problems in your life. And if you'll give him a chance, he will. So may the Lord be with you. Watch over, bless you, and keep you. Fill you with his spirit and cause your life to just overflow in the abundance that he wants to bestow upon you. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. Jesus is real. Jesus is real. Jesus is real. He's so real to me. He saved my soul. He saved my soul. He saved my soul. And he made me whole. I praise his name.